which he has entitled, Two by Two into the Harvest. Good morning, everybody. Morning, David. I've been asked on uh, about the 4th of March to do a sermon in Adelaide on the theme of uh, sowing, watering, and reaping. And I thought today I would um, do a trial run here. Well, it wasn't <laughs> a trial run. Half my workload, in, a, in other words, and, and, and share this message with you because I believe it's a... It's a an important message for all of us, this message of two by two into the harvest. Does anybody remember any sink or swim experiences when they were starting a new job? I can remember uh, one very clearly, a sink or swim experience. I, I was trained, I was a student at university and I needed a, a job in my holiday and the job I chose was a children's indoor cricket umpire. Okay. So I got my training to take on this high pressure job, <laughs> umpiring junior indoor cricket games and I got to my first game after all the training and I could not cope. I had to step up, I had to step up that day and, and do the job, but I tell you what, these little children were all over me with criticising my umpiring decisions and I have to confess I'm a failed indoor cricket umpire. First day on the job, I quit. Sink or swim, do you remember some sink or swim experiences? I've, I've even quit another job on the first day, but I won't go into that. But the time finally came and it comes when with all the training, we have to step up and do what we've been trained to do. Christian discipleship is similar. We, we, we study the Bible, we, 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 we're taught, hopefully, and um, we, we prepare ourselves that maybe some experienced Christians show us the way, how we, how we need to, um, to serve Christ, and then the time comes, and, and we're given power, we're given power by the Holy Spirit, and we're ready to go, and then the time comes when we have to step up and walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Now, that time came for the 70 disciples who we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to share about as we look at this passage today. That time came for them. It had already come for the 12. They had to step up. Jesus was sending them out. Now, as I read Luke 10, let's, let's listen to what Jesus has to say to the 70 disciples and let's put ourselves in their shoes. Think about how they would have been feeling now as the time had come to be sent out on a mission. And as Christians, we've been sent out on a mission as disciples of Christ. We've been commissioned, we've been trained, and we've been sent out on a mission. We've been empowered. Now let's read Luke 10, 1 to 3. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send the laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Without you, Jesus, without you, we just have to go our way with, without you. Then we read on verse 3, go your way, behold I send you out as lambs among wolves. Hmm. What? What do you mean? You're sending us to the wolves on our own? Uh, no, 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 I'm not sending you on your own, I'm sending you two by two as lambs to the wolves. Carry neither money back. What? You mean we have to go out? It's lambs to the wolves without any money bag? Yes. 
That's what I'm asking you to do. To go out without any money bag. Carry no knapsack. What do you mean? No, no supplies, Jesus. We, we, we can't take any supplies with us. That's right. You're going out like that. Nor sandals. What are you talking about, Christ? Jesus, are you, are you meaning we're to go barefoot or are you meaning we're not to carry an extra pair of sandals? Well, I, I'm confused. What, what, why? What, what, what's this, this all about? Can you picture yourself in the shoes of the disciples or the sandals, we'll say, of the disciples as they're getting this instruction? And greet no one along the road. So, so if, if, if we, we don't know the directions, if we, if we need help with directions, Jesus, we're not to greet anybody. If, if we run out of, if our sandals break, if we, we don't have any money for food, we, we just can't greet anyone. Yep. That's what I'm telling you to do. No good morning. No good day. No good day. No, no. That doesn't sound, that doesn't sound very friendly to you, Jesus, what you're saying for us to do. That's what I'm saying to do. And then we read on, Jesus says... But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. And if not, it will return to you. So let me get this straight. Lord, you, you're saying we, we, we just got to go up to that door of perfect strangers. And we just say, peace to this house. And... If the, and some of them won't even let us in, so we're just going to go to the next one and do it again. Yep, that's what I'm asking you to do. And then Jesus continues. He says, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. But what if the food is 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 Terrible. What if the, the cook is, is just useless and, and, and the food is, is scary? Do, do, we, do we still eat the food? Do not go from house to house. Stay there. A laborer is worthy of his wages. But, but we, we have nothing. To, you want us to go house to house and we've got nothing to give them? We're just to go there and, and, and sponge off them? Eat their food. Yes, a labourer is worthy of his wages. But what will they think of us arriving with nothing? A labourer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Eat what things are set before you. The instructions continue. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as they Set before you. You already said that. You already told us that to eat whatever things have been set before us. Why are you repeating yourself, Lord? Whatever city you go to, eat whatever is set before you. The same rules apply, and I want you to stick to these rules. No, no shortcuts. No, no tweaking what I've had to say to you. you. You have to obey me as I have said it. Even if the cook is really, really bad. Jesus continues verse 9. And he says, and heal the sick. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. That's your thing, Christ. Jesus, that's your thing. You heal the sick. How do you expect us to heal the sick? Us? Really? You heard me. You heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The kingdom of God has come near to you. Oh, I, I can remember that. that that's easy. That, that's not much to say. That... that Sounds, sounds okay. But what if they ask for more information, Christ? No, just say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Jesus continues in verse 10 and he says, But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, 
go out into the streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. The very dust of the city that clings to us, we wipe off against you. That sounds very confrontational. Will they hurt us, Christ? Will they hurt us if we're so confrontational? Say, the very dust of the city that clings to us, we wipe off against you. And say, nevertheless, yes, yes, we know the kingdom of God has come near you. Say that. I like that part. I like that part. That's nice and short. I can remember. I like short sermons. I think this might be a short sermon today, everybody. I like that part. I, I can remember that. Can you just imagine the disciples at that moment? It's time to step up. It's time to go out without Christ at their side. He's been with them for so long, training them, showing them the way, by example. And, and, and now they are, are sent out on, on such a mission. How would have you have felt in their shoes? You're going out as lambs among wolves. You don't have any money. You don't have any supplies. You've got to go and, up to strangers' doors. And you, you just got to expect that they're going to let you stay with them. You've got to eat whatever stuff they serve up to you. You're going to be rejected. You have to go to another door. You're going to have cities that are going to reject you. And, and, and you, you're going to be thrust out. And you've got to say to them, the dust, we wipe it off against you. Put yourself in the disciples' shoes right, right now. But then I want you to put yourself in their shoes in another way now. You're not being sent out two by two into the harvest. Sowing, watering and reaping. Jeez, let's, let's say that Jesus had not sent them out two by two, but had sent them out as individuals on their own into that same circumstances. Alone. Matthew had to go alone. If Matthew had to go alone, if Judas had to go alone with that commission. Ecclesiastes 4 9 to 12 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. Who goes into a, a natural harvest, into a grain harvest, on their own. Thank God that this is not His way. This is not Jesus' way of sending people out on their own. And, and, and this scripture shows the advantages of being two by two and, and, and having even three, doesn't it? We see the advantages there. They have a good reward for their labor. Why? Because their strength is doubled. They um, are more productive. They have a more varied skill set, or, or if we're talking Christianity, more varied gifts to share. And we know the old proverb, two heads are, are better than one. And, and we see there, if, if one falls, if one is weak, they have a person beside them to encourage them, to, to lift them up, to, to strengthen them, a companion to toil with, extra strength. Physically, extra strength emotionally, extra strength spiritually. Two are better than one. And then there's the credibility issue as well, which we don't see in that passage if there's two or more. The credibility, as, as we know in the scriptures, about the witnessing power. You, two or three witnesses. 
Two are better than one. And then we've got, we see in that passage, that the protection. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. There's that protection as well. And what about a, what about a team? If people go out as a team, I, who's heard of this acronym? Together, each achieve more. Together, each achieve more. Team. Thank God. I want to thank God. I want to thank Christ that His way is not sending us out into the harvest on our own as individuals. He didn't do it there with the disciples. And I want to show you some, some scriptures where this principle of sending out two by two or, or more is, is right throughout the, the ministry of, of the disciples and the ministry of Jesus. And I want to encourage us with it because I believe that as Christians, too often we are going about our own thing, our own ministry for, for Christ as an individual, as a solo person. And many of us are doing that in, in the Christian faith. We need to be, let, let's look at two by two as we look at these scriptures, the importance of it. And we see in Luke 10, 1, after these things the Lord appointed 70 also and he sent them two by two. Now, apart from the sending of the 70, 70 disciples out two by two, we, we know about the sending of the 12 disciples. They were sent on a very similar mission, two by two. Two disciples were sent by Jesus to prepare the Passover meal. Two disciples were sent to, to get that, that donkey for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem. John 8.17 says the testimony of two men is true. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. At Pentecost, when Peter preached the sermon, that saw 3,000 souls give their life to Christ. Peter was not on his own as he was preaching that day. The apostles sent Peter and John, two men, to Samaria. When news had been heard that, that the gospel, the good news of Jesus having risen from the dead after dying for our sins on the cross, when they heard that the Samarians were, were receiving this message, two people were sent again. Peter and John were sent. When Tabitha feels, fell sick, and you see this in Acts 9, 36 to 38, and died, the disciples sent two men to implore Peter to come without delay. Two by two by two by two or more, two or three or more. When Agabus prophesied that there would be a great famine throughout all the world in the days of Claudius Caesar, the disciples decided to send relief to the brethren in Judea with two men, Saul and Barnabas, Acts 11.30. The Jerusalem Council and their decision, two men, Judas and Silas, Acts 15, they were sent out to share that message together, to spread that around. The ruling, Acts 15, 36 to 41, we see that Barnabas and John Mark went together to see how the churches were going in, in, in Cyprus, after a little bit of an argument there, uh, with uh, who, who should go with who. Uh, and two men, Paul and Silas, went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. In Acts 16 to 25, we see Paul and Silas were in prison together. They were in prison together when that famous earthquake happened. And the prison doors were open and the jailer wanted to do away with himself. But he didn't because there, there were the prisoners were still there. And he gave his life to Christ that day. As he had seen the witness of Paul and Silas together. Singing to, to God in prison. Being obedient to God. Salvation came that day. 
Paul sent two men, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, Acts 19.22. We hear a lot about a couple who served together, Priscilla and Aquila, or Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla, which way, ever way you want it. And in this Romans 16, three, verses 3 to 4 is one of the mentions of this couple. And it's Priscilla and Aquila who ministered together, risking their necks in the service of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, 12 had strongly urged an unwilling Apollos to take brethren with him to visit the Corinthians. Don't go on your own. Take some brethren with you, Apollos. We know why. We know why, don't we? As we, we, we? We looked at that two are better than one verse. And the implications of serving in ministry alongside somebody. 1 Corinthians 16, 17 says three men, a threefold cord is not easily broken. Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Archaeus. Let me do that again. Archaicus came in person to Paul and supplied what lacked, refreshing his spirit. We're nearly done with, with some of these scriptures. 1 Timothy 4.11, Paul writes to Timothy, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Get John Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful for me to ministry. And, and that's really interesting, that verse, because remember, uh, I didn't mention it earlier, but there was a bit of a dispute between who Paul would take it. He didn't want it, Mark to come with him. But now he recognizes Mark is useful to him in ministry. Titus 3.13, Paul writes, send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos two by two on their journey with, with haste. In Hebrews 13, 23, the writer says, Know that our brother Timothy, Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Paul, we, we, we really see him on his own. He's got companions with the work, with the mission that he's doing. And we see at the start of 1 and 2 Thessalonians 1 that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, they were together as co-authors. And again, with Philippians 1, 1 and Colossians 1, 1, Paul and Timothy were both sending out these letters. Too often as Christians, and I, I, I've gone door knocking many times on my own, many times. And I remember when I remember that I can only remember three times. It might have been more since I've been in New Zealand in, in the last six years, where my wife came with me, door knocking. I, there was somebody else who came at other points in time. But the first time Angela came out door knocking with me, the family who we met at the door started coming to church. They rang us, I think it was the next week, on a on a Sunday morning or Saturday, Saturday night and said, when's your church? And we said, normally Saturday, but uh, we'll have it tomorrow morning. And so they came and they came for quite a, they came for a couple of months, I think. The next time we went out door knocking, not long after that, we, we came across a Korean family. They rang us up Sunday morning and said, when's your church service? I said, oh, well, we normally have it Saturday, but uh, come, we'll have it this morning at 10.30. <laughs> and they came. Several for a long time and, and, and helped lead us to a lot of Korean people over the years. Good strike rate. David not on his own. David with help. The Lord is with us. And the third time my wife came out with me door knocking, believe it or not, the person we met, she came to church the very next week as well, although she only came once. Two by two, we've been sent into the harvest. And praise God, because what, lack, what is lacking in, in, in me, what is lacking in you, may well be compensated or complemented by the person who's, who's working alongside of you. And we see that this was Christ's way. Are you doing 
ministry for the Lord too often on your own? Or are you just staying at home on your own and not really getting involved in, in this commissioned work as we have been sent into the harvest? We are fishers of men. So the message today is, I have a challenge. I have an invitation and a challenge for all of us today. I want you to form into groups of two or more and plan a new ministry with somebody in the group. Or if you're already really involved in a ministry and you'd like to bring somebody else on board, maybe so there's not just one of you, not just two of you, maybe three of you, bring them on board. I'd really like to encourage you to come back in six weeks' time and to report about what your plans were and, and how you've been doing it and, and maybe ideally in a couple of weeks time just come back and, and let us know what, what your plans are for the ministry. It might be a work of prayer, which is a sowing work, a watering work, a reaping work as well as, as we pray. And starting this week there's going to be a, a prayer meeting during the day for uh, just for one hour, and it will be this Tuesday from 11 to 12 at somebody's house. Um, let's say my house at this stage until we, unless we, unless you hear otherwise. But w there was a lady last year who used to come to our church, and she she said to me, David, look, you need to have people regularly praying for your ministry. And she said in, in the church that she now attends, they started a prayer group for about one hour a week or a couple of hours a week, every week. And that church was down to, you know, maybe 10 people. And she said now, now we're, we're pushing up to about 100 people in Tauranga. Sounds incredible. But don't doubt what, what God can do through prayer. So, so uh, we're going to start a, a, a prayer group, even if it was only um, Angela and I at our house for an extra hour a week praying for the ministry, not just my ministry, but the ministry of all of us, because we are a body, praying for the ministry of the church. For those who don't have to work at that time, we, 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 that's one avenue we might want to say, okay, that, that's the two by two or more thing I want to get involved in. And I, I know Ju Judy's already um, signed up to be part of that. Thank you, Judy. Another thing we might be involved in is in sowing, watering and reaping. It might be part of this plan that you come up with, is, is in a plan with, with evangelism. And... Um, be so nice if you have if we have a you have a plan for that and it's not just one of you on your own doing doing your, your own thing another area which is is also a sowing a, a watering and a reaping thing uh, which 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 is part of evangelism is is a helps ministry to other people and one thing the church has been focusing on a little bit but it's kind of died a little bit over the last while, is a niche ministry, which, which I really want to get back into with uh, a lot of effort, is a niche ministry to large families. And this week, that ministry um, got re reignited in that I, I got on my knees and I said to God, where do you want me to move now? What do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to move, so I'm on, on my own thinking, okay, what am I going to do on my own today? And um, immediately what came into my head was a family of nine who have 
fellowship with us about three times. They just came into my head, and, and the last communication I had was six months before. Uh, please do not, um, please leave me alone at the moment. I thought, okay, at the moment. That's six months ago. So <laughs> I sent him a, a message and say, look, it's back to school time. You have seven children. It, it must be a really demanding time for you guys. And he, he immediately rang, rang me back and was happy to receive uh, some financial support from the church for that. And it was no strings attached. I said, we don't expect anything in return. But he said, we'll see you at church, uh, which will be next week, God willing. Um, and then he, I, I did say, do you know any other large families? And he has two brothers in a similar situation. And so we helped them as well. But the way I, I believe to, to move this ministry forward is, and if, if there's nobody who will come with me, I will, I will go during the daytime. If, well, I'm going to go, if nobody will go with me, I want to go anyway, but I'd rather go with somebody just around the neighborhoods, close to the church, looking for households which obviously have children. Thank you, Rachel. You, you know, like the big trampolines, and I just want to just greet them and, and let them know that as a church, this is, this is the, what we, we, we really want, we, we understand the difficulties here with large families and we want to help. I've got no problems doing that, but it would be lovely to do it, not on my, my own. There are, as we saw in some of the two by two things, there are many other things that you might think of. One of them there was just going around strengthening the churches that went two by two. It might be going around strengthening brethren in the church, a visitation, ministry. If you are in close relationship with somebody, that might be the easiest thing to organize just the two of you to plan a ministry that you two can work on together with. But start whatever we're going to do. If we're going to make any plans, we come together, two of us or more, and we start with prayer, asking God's direction for what our two by two mission will be. We may well already be involved in something, and it's just a matter of stepping up with that and sharing your plans with the church so we can pray for what you are doing already in your two by two or more. You could bring people on, on board to that. Maybe you, you, there's somebody in the church you, you feel you just want to invite into you, your couple that you have. Yeah, come, come on board. We, we want you to, to work with us if you would like that. Encourage them to get involved. And remember in your planning that the church does have funds as well. If what you're planning needs some funds. The church has some funds to support outreach, mission. Because we don't want to stay small. We don't want to see people lost. We want to see God glorify. For Jesus Christ died on the cross for all. And it does say narrow is the way and few find it, but there's also a great harvest that God is wanting us to go out into so that people are saved. Finally, as I close, I said it would be a short sermon. I think it's a short sermon. Finally, be inspired by Christ's example of dying on the cross. Dying on the cross for our sins. It's something that only he could have done. Because he was perfect. He was without sin. He was a spotless lamb. Only he could have died on the cross for our sins. To pay the penalty for, for your sin and, and my sin. Nobody else could do it. But was he alone? When he was on the cross. Who says he was alone while he was on the cross? Who says he wasn't alone? Who says he was alone? Who was there at the cross when Jesus was doing what only he could do? There were, there were the women there mourning and weeping. There was, John was there. 
Jesus died on the cross for our sins, doing what only he could do. And if we haven't received that salvation, that free salvation that, that has been given to us by God as a gift through faith, by the undeserved kindness of God, to sacrifice his son by the undeserved kindness of Christ. If somebody listening here or on the later on online, remember the love of Christ there. Remember, he it says in the scripture, yet scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love of God for us. That's the, and I don't like the song that says that's a reckless love because God's not reckless. But this is a very extravagant love. This is a, a, a sacrifice of sacrifices. This is, this is for you and me, and it's for everybody for eternity, and this message is alive in the 21st century. Praise God, it's alive, and it will stay alive. And that cry of repent, believe, and be baptized will keep going out until Christ returns. And I want, if anybody hasn't accepted that message and accepted Christ, receive Him today. Finally, brethren... Please don't go home today and forget the challenge. Please go home and pray about this challenge. I want to hear back from you what your plans are as you are going out sowing and watering and reaping two by two or more. God bless you. God strengthen you in the mighty name of Christ. Amen.